Um, Ivan, please. I, I believe you do not need any introduction because everyone, yeah. everyone knows you. So please, go ahead. Oh, that's great. Uh, Maxim, thank you. Uh, the only problem is that I don't have direct access to the chat. So uh, could you help me? And if any questions in the chat appear, could you tell me about that? Yeah, okay. sure. No problem. I will do that. Okay, thank you, Maxim. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, and um, today I'll uh, tell you about um, our rather work in progress on waveguide quantum open mechanics. And uh, since it's work in progress, uh, quite fascinating work in progress, there will be a lot of uh, hand waving uh, and uh, some advertising and even some uh, results. So I'll start uh, from um, from a brief introduction, uh, trying to explain uh, all the parts of the title uh, separately. So I'll start from optomechanics. Uh, I believe that uh, many in, this, in my audience are familiar with quantum mechanics uh, more deeply than I am, but I'll be just quite uh, very brief. So if you've got a polarizable particle uh, in, uh, in the light electromagnetic field or a beam, then you can introduce uh, the, uh, then there is a certain potential. Uh, can I draw? Yeah. A certain potential O, which is actually uh, proportional to polarization of the particle and spatially dependent electric field. Of course, there are uh, other parts uh, uh, which have more complicated structure, which, uh, um, which can be introduced to this potential. We consider just the simplest case. And uh, in this case, uh, you can introduce, of course, a force acting on this particle, which is just a gradient uh, of this potential. And well, uh, one uh, of them, uh, of the most like notorious examples of these optomechanic forces are the optical tweezers, uh, which have been introduced in this paper, uh, well, uh, 33 years ago, uh, and uh, by Ashkin, uh, who got a Nobel Prize for that in 2018, where they took uh, okay, a Ga Gaussian beam placed a small particle inside uh, and uh, they had a, a pulling force uh, towards, uh, towards the center of the beam uh, and which is, which is now vastly used in, uh, in biophotonics and so on and so forth. I would also like to uh, mention, um, give me a second, uh, to let you notice the last uh, author of this uh, seminal paper probably will return uh, to him in some slides further. So that's basically optomechanics, which can be treated classically. Then uh, you can notice that there are actually three uh, colors in this equation, a uh, red one, a blue one, and a green one, which actually correspond to three different degrees of freedom uh, in our structure. So which are the electromagnetic field, which is colored in um, in blue, a uh, mechanical motion, so mechanical degree of freedom, the position of our uh, particle, and the internal degrees of freedom, which based on just the polarization. Uh, but well, actually, if you are talking about some uh, source, it can, can have some uh, complex structure. So uh, if we are going to uh, to go quantum, right? Uh, actually, there is not uh, quite clear which way to go quantum, actually, because uh, there are actually many choices and many directions. Uh, Vanya, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, can I stop you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Why do you need to go quantum? Why? Yeah. Well, I'll drift, uh, I'll, uh, that's what I now going to talk about why do we need to go quantum mm -hmm. because it appears that in, in some cases you can have certain effects which uh which are hardly 
uh, described within the classical open mechanics. Okay. And then I'll just, I'll just try to list a couple of such effects uh, depending on which way in quantizing you are going. Uh, Vanya, may, may have, it's, it's Andrei Bogdanov. Yeah. May I have a question, please? Mm -hmm. So, uh, the question is following. So, uh, in, uh, it's, in my opinion, it's clear uh, how to in introduce some potential force in quantum world. So, you need just to introduce a potential. Then in, you can introduce mm -hmm. some gradient. Yes. Mm -hmm. But how about, uh, as we know, the optomechanical force has all, not only a conservative part, but also non-conservative mm -hmm. part. So, Definitely. and... Uh, and uh, how it's possible to introduce just fundamentally, maybe just by wave handling it's necessary, but the, the, mm -hmm. this second force, non-conservative. Mm -hmm. Well, actually you do have, you, ca you can actually introduce non-conservative uh, uh, non-conservative forces in quantum um, mechanics. You, you probably you know about, well, you definitely know about the density matrix which has uh, both conservative dynamics, which corresponds yeah. to the with Hamiltonian and non-conservative part. And actually what uh, I'll be talking about uh, in my talk will briefly concern the non-conservative dynamics. Yep, so it, it well, actually uh, the uh, most of the topic of like of the original results concerns uh, non-conservative dynamics. Andrei, did I answer your question? But well, I yes. didn't answer your question. I just promised. Yes, yes, yes. It, 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 somewhere. It's up to me. It's, it, this question is up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what you can do? Well, you can say, okay, uh, let us leave the uh, mechanical degree of freedom classical, and let let us uh, forget about quantization of the internal degrees of freedom of a system. Let us only quantize the electromagnetic field. And what, uh, what we know about, well, of course, in this case, you introduce the separators of creation and annihilation, and you can, okay, there is a, I can see a question in the chat now. Yeah. Can I? I just... Hello? Current P, spatial and transition state, or they are considered independent. Question from Shakhov. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. So, uh, Shakap is asking whether uh, R and P, so coordinated polarization, are somehow correlated or they are considered as independent variables. So far, they are considered as independent variables. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and in this case, uh, if you quantize electromagnetic field, one of the known results that you got this one over two part which corresponds to the uh, vacuum electromagnetic field which has uh, uh, which is like electric field uh, uh, which is present there even in the case when you have no photons here right uh, and there are uh, many effects which can be attributed to, to this uh, vacuum electromagnetic field in some ways you even can describe spontaneous emission in this uh, in this language, uh, still you can uh, 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 there are ways where you, where you how you can describe spontaneous emission without vacuum electromagnetic field, but well, uh, doesn't matter. And in this case, probably uh, one of the uh, most uh, well for me actually interesting uh, consequence of this uh, this optomechanics where the electromagnetic field is quantized is the so-called the, uh, the dynamical Casimir effect, which uh, well, was theoretically described like in this paper in 1970. Then there was a couple of statements that it has been observed experimentally uh, quite recently. So the baseline is the following. Suppose that you have uh, a macroscopic mirror uh, mirrors a cavity, and uh, uh, suppose that you start to uh, to oscillate the mirror with a certain frequency, and it appears that that when the oscillation of the mirror, uh, the uh, the frequency of the oscillation of the mirror uh, is close or exceeds 
uh, the uh, resonant frequency of the photons inside the cavity, you got the, the uh, output photon flux. Uh, so the cavity, even it even it was empty initially, starts to emit photons. The interesting thing is, uh, is that these photons are not, uh, their statistic is not classical. So these are, uh, these are, uh, so the, the light starts to emit uh, in pairs. So uh, it starts to emit pairs of photons uh, in this case. Okay, so this, uh, this is something, uh, if you quantize the electromagnetic field, then you can actually, what you can do, you can say, okay, I'll, I'll quantize, uh, you give me a second. So, ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Then you can actually uh, quantize not, uh, not only uh, electromagnetic field, but you can also quantize the mechanical motion. Uh, uh, suppose that you have a cavity uh, and uh, yeah. again, you have one of the mirrors uh, oscillating with respect to some, uh, some stationary position, uh, you can say, okay, then you, uh, uh, then you have uh, delta R, which is proportional to the sum of the creation and annihilation operators of, of the phonons in your system, which obey the commutation relations. Then you can write down the effective Hamiltonian in your case and get and then the effective Hamiltonian, which actually couples the uh, the cavity degrees of freedom and the mechanical motion, yeah, the phonons. Uh, and uh, this is actually a huge field of uh, cavity optomechanics. There is a nice review on this in the reviews of, uh, in the reviews of modern physics. And there are like a whole variety of these cavity optomechanics and uh, the applications range from uh, on chip optical modulators, uh, people use cavity optomechanics to generate squeeze light uh, for sensing and so on and so forth. And actually these uh, uh, optomechanical cavities, they, um, they cover the huge, uh, the huge scale of, uh, of, well, I don't know how to call with mass, yeah, of, of uh, your system. So starting from the macroscopic mirrors, so you can think uh, probably even about the LIGO uh, system, down to the micro disk resonators, down to uh, nanomechanical and micromechanical structures, and finally down to a scale of single atoms uh, in an optical cavity. Uh, usually in this uh, optomechanical uh, cavity optomechanics, uh, people don't introduce the quantized matter actually. So they are fine with uh, uh, with uh, cavity degrees of freedom and uh, uh, <clears throat> and mechanical motion and phonons, because uh, well, usually it is anticipated that that introduce some additional quantum scatterers or uh, quantum emitters introduce additional losses. And usually uh, they consider the systems where you have only uh, cavity modes and the phonons. And finally, you can actually, uh, well, not finally, there are many options, but you can quantize internal degrees of freedom, right? In this case, well, this is a classical result for the polarization and you can go from the from the polarizability which is a classical number to the operator which describes the discrete atomic levels if it's an atom or a quantum or, or superconducting qubit which describes the uh, the occupation and correlations uh, uh, of different dis discrete states in your system so the simplest example, example is a, just a two-level system where you have a ground state and you have an excited state, and then your matrix S 
can be fully characterized by the Pauli matrices, right? Here. And well, you can introduce the uh, the Hamiltonian of uh, electromagnetic field. In this case, you have the part uh, which is responsible just for the electromagnetic field. You have the uh, atomic part, and you have the coupling part here. Uh, and uh, well, that's the simplest case for 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 a typical system. And actually. Uh, uh, in this case, what you can do, you can play with uh, uh, with some optical mechanics or 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 uh, phonomics, I don't know, uh, of uh, single atoms. And the uh, most prominent example is the uh, is the laser cooling of atoms. Uh, and actually, uh, if you remember, I mentioned. Uh, in the slide of classical optomechanics, I mentioned this uh, third author, author of the paper on Tweezer, Stephen Chu. And Stephen Chu actually, uh, he, uh, soon after uh, the seminal work with Ashkin, he left and he started to work on the, on the from classical optomechanics, he went to, we can say, to quantum optomechanics and he started to work on laser cooling. And that probably, allowed him to get his Nobel Prize 20 years uh, before the before Ashkin actually exactly for for uh, atomic uh, atomic uh, laser cooling that probably could uh, be an additional answer to your question Misha why do we need to go quant uh, okay okay <laughs> yeah uh, well, no joke. So the applications are well, atomic clocks. Well, usually main application is the the uh, preparation of the ultra cold atomic matter. So this laser cooling. Uh, so the simplest is a Doppler one. I will not uh, stop the details, but there are different schemes. Uh, they actually allowed to cool down the matter to the record low temperatures of like tens of nano kelvin. Okay. So, uh, well, yeah, and as we know, in, uh, already the discrete atomic levels uh, bring the effective optical nonlinearity in the system, even in the absence of, of uh, mechanical degrees of freedom, they bring it to the uh, single photon level, or mainly because if you have just a discrete level and you have a photon propagating, uh, then suppose that you uh, excite uh, one electron to the upper level by a single photon, but if the other photon uh, is going after the first one, then it, uh, then it cannot be absorbed because the excited state is occupied. And this actually like this uh, quantum emitters or two level systems are uh, the most nonlinear element which you could think of. Okay, so, uh, uh, Again, we return to the question, which uh, way we go in quantizing our optomechanics, uh, because, well, there are many options, and the answer is that, okay, we'll try to, to go all directions simultaneously, uh, all of them, and here we will use uh, as a playground the, uh, what is called the waveguard quantum optics, which is briefly, uh, an array of uh, two level systems of uh, qubits uh, placed on top of a waveguide or uh, fiber, an optical fiber. And this is uh, now quite uh, already a, a well known Hamiltonian, which describes the, uh, well, this one corresponds to the continuous degrees of freedom of the photons in the waveguide. This one corresponds to the atomic degrees of freedom, and this one corresponds to the coupling between the photons uh, and uh, uh, and the two level systems uh, in our system. Then uh, usually what you can do, you can actually integrate out the photonic degrees of freedom and leave with the effective Hamiltonian which corresponds to the uh, 
which corresponds just to the interaction between the uh, between the qubits by uh, exchanging of the waveguide. So uh, Sasha made quite uh, a few uh, talks on that, so I will not uh, stop at the details. Well, just a, a mention that, well, we use the Markov approximation here. Uh, and well, uh, that we actually notice that the waveguides in the photons are don't uh, actually don't decay. You got this kind of uh, infinite range interactions in your system. So, and Vanya, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. A question about the Hamiltonian. So, does mm -hmm. AK is the same as uh, CK, uh, first term and the last term? Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry for this mistake. Yeah, this is the same. AK and CK are the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank sorry. you. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the realizations of these systems, like, well, there are actually two realizations uh, as far as I know. So the first one are the uh, superconducting uh, qubit arrays, and these are done uh, a lot by the group of uh, Ustinov. So this is one of the recent papers, so that's how it looks like. So. Uh, each of the two level system is called the uh, flux qubit. Uh, it's kind of just, uh, there are some questions in the chat. Uh, I can see now, I'll try to open it. Uh, sorry, the coupling between the resonator is considered zero. Uh, you mean the direct coupling between the resonators? Be uh, direct coupling between the two level systems? Yeah, this setup. In this, uh, the direct coupling between the different level system is considered zero. So the only coupling which is, is just via the creation and absorption of the waveguide photons. Shahab, did I answer your question? Shahab, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, uh, so the other, uh, the other systems are actually a single, uh, Atoms uh, which are trapped in the uh, in the optical traps and placed in the vicinity waveguide, and this is done. Uh, well, you can see that actually there are our former colleagues, Sasha Sherman. This is done in the in the in Paris in a laboratory where Cohen Tanuji was uh, uh, working. As if I if I don't make a mistake, so they it's actually. Uh, well, now this is kind of state-of-the-art technology, it can be done, and there are like different applications uh, of the system, so you can do, uh, uh, you can control photon statistics in this structure, so I've been doing some of this work uh, in the waveguide uh, with quantum dots, then there is a huge uh, activity on generating many body correlations in this system, then uh, there are like a couple of uh, uh, well, quite a few works uh, by Sasha uh, and Sasha uh, and colleagues uh, on the emerging fascinating zoo of two particle excitations in these systems. So, well, and uh, uh, the uh, applications and phenomena are not limited to the list, of course. So, wavewide quantum optics is quite, quite uh, a nice and interesting uh, topic and rapidly emerging. So what we do, we can actually uh, uh, move from quantum optics to quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, so what does it mean? We say, okay, uh, if we're talking about atoms, items are trapped in the optical traps. Usually uh, these optical traps can be regarded as some harmonic potential. It means that actually uh, atoms can move within this harmonic potential, uh, kind of as uh, as linked to a spring, right? And they oscillate uh, certain frequencies uh, with respect to the uh, stationary positions. And uh, uh, in Hamiltonian, it just means that actually you change, well, amend the uh, quantum optics uh, Hamiltonian by adding the phononic degrees of freedom, which is uh, which is this one, uh, and 
but also uh, in the coupling coefficient in the phase or in the phase you should add the quantile displacement which is here and here uh, which corresponds to the to the uh, change uh, in the phase due to the displacements of the atoms from the stationary positions and again you can uh, you can integrate out the uh, the photonic degrees of freedom and well for the simplest case of two qubits you end up with a, with a Hamiltonian of the following shape and actually uh, what you can notice even now that this Hamiltonian is actually non-fermission uh, because well it has the part here and it has the part here so this part corresponds to the well since your system is open right uh, even though we don't consider the uh, uh, the decay of the atoms to the far field, we still can uh, the, the photons can emit uh, the qubits can emit photons which propagate to the infinity along the wavelet and never return. So the system actually loses energy. So your Hamiltonian is non-fermion one, and uh, well, that's that's I'm now starting to answer the question by Andre, right? So actually, uh, nothing is conservative here, as you can see, right? And uh, uh, well, what you can introduce, you can introduce the symmetric and the symmetric displacement. So symmetric displacement is just the movement of the uh, center of mass of our two qubits and uh, uh, anti-symmetric, which is labeled D, is just the, the uh, oscillations uh, uh, with, the, with the center of mass being still, right? It's just like this. Vanya, yeah. Vanya, can I, can I ask you a question here? Yes, sure. Uh, so there are some new notations appeared. Uh, yes. So when you, when you move to this new Hamiltonian, so mm -hmm. even x y x one x and x two, uh, what do you what do you mean by that? So ah, x one, x two, and x one are the displacements of uh, this is x two and this is x one. So and z that was previously z. Am I right? Ah, z. So z z yeah. Uh, z the other uh, stationary positions of your atoms. So this is okay. Z. So your your current position is z one plus x one, right? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, uh -huh. if I may say, it was uh, like invention of Vanya because we mm -hmm. struggled a lot with this Hamiltonian uh, in second quantization approach. So if you use this operators B and B deck for phonons, it was a problem for us just how to solve it. And then we found out that instead of using the second quantization approach, it's uh, easier to go to quantum mechanics like 70 years ago or <laughs> even 80 and just write parabolic potential for phonons. It's easier technically because you just can solve the result in Schrodinger equation directly. Yeah, one dimensional Schrodinger mm -hmm. and something that we all can uh, do numerically. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sasha. Um, okay, so uh, so yeah, you, you move to the to these new coordinates of the uh, center of mass displacement and the relative displacement. And in this case, uh, well, and also you move in the, in the qubit degrees of freedom, you move to this symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations, plus minus, where L and R are just the state of the left and right qubits. So this one is L, right, and this one is R. By the way, can you see what I'm writing here on the screen? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. yes we can. Yeah, we can. yeah, yeah. yeah. So and in this case, uh, in this case, it, uh, after making this transform, we can see that first uh, our uh, xs degree of freedom becomes uh, totally decoupled, 
so uh, so the two qubits uh, motion of the two qubits of the center of mass uh, isn't affected by the coupling uh, with a, with a waveguide uh, it's also just a, uh, it's just a Hamiltonian right of the free harmonic oscillator but uh, for the case of the D displacement relative displacement you get this effective Hamiltonian so this is the uh, just a one-dimensional Hamiltonian which can be treated uh, numerically uh, but before I uh, move to that I'll just make a, a short step aside so regarding the actual dimensions so so far we are writing all we are writing uh, we are writing some Formulas, probably it's uh, worth uh, discussing what we're actually talking about. So, what numbers? So, uh, we consider that, well, we're working in the optical uh, frequency range, and uh, we can say, okay, so the, the wavelength uh, of our system is of the order of one micron, which is, well, I believe, reasonable. Then you've got this U0 here, which is actually. Um, the a quanta of mechanical degree of freedom. So it's actually the the length, uh, the maximum display, like relative displacements, displacement of the atoms with respect uh, to to stationary position. And well, this is a kind of a very conservative uh, conservative. Uh, how to say it? Uh, estimation. Right, but we can say, okay, let uh, let this uh, scale be uh, bounded from above by the atomic de Broglie wavelength. So, to what uh, at which uh, scales can we can we think of the atom as a, as a wave, right? And uh, this quantity is actually defined by the this is the de Broglie wavelength uh, dB. Uh, where p thermal is the momentum of the of an atom defined by by just thermal fluctuation, right? Because you have some temperature atoms uh, move, right? Uh, and their velocity is defined by by temperature. So your thermal momentum is defined roughly uh, by by this quantity where M is the mass of an atom. So if you treat it, for example, lithium atoms, it's like 10 to minus 26 kilos. Then your parameter eta, which is quite important for us, uh, it is defined as uh, 4p u0 over lambda. And from this, we can actually estimate what are the temperatures at which our eta uh, is uh, of the order of unity. Right, and it appears that the temperature is about one micro Kelvin, which of course uh, seems rather a small temperature, but at the same time, it's kind of a, a routine temperature for for uh, cold items experiments. Yeah, where they usually operate in like micro Kelvin, hundreds nano Kelvin temperature range, and in this uh, temperature, your uh, your frequency of your phonons right of your uh, discrete uh, uh, quantum of the mechanical energy are about 100 kilohertz and uh, uh, gamma zero uh, of course it depends on the on the specific nature of uh, of the radiative transition of your atom well but usually it's in the range well it cannot be it, 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 it's hardly hardly can be larger than uh, more than one gigahertz, but uh, it can be actually in in quite uh, a broad range between zero and one gigahertz. Uh, okay, so uh, another step aside is regarding the coupling strength. So uh, we can rewrite our Hamiltonian in the following way, well, approximately uh, changing uh, changing the exponent making the Taylor expansion of the exponent and leaving only the linear uh, part here uh, 
uh, and well, throwing off the constant terms. And we can see that, that this uh, Hamiltonian actually in some way uh, uh, resembles the quite uh, widely known the Hamiltonian of the quantum Rabi model. Uh, well, first of all, quantum Rabi model Hamiltonian is Hermitian, uh, but uh, in our case, the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian, but the structure is quite similar. So we got this Fanoni, uh, in this case, these are photons for the Rabi model. Here we have phonons. Then you have the, uh, the atomic degree of freedom. In our case, we uh, and I now simplified Hamiltonian, we don't have the, uh, this sigma z term. And they also have this term which corresponds to just uh, polarization of your, uh, of your atom in the electric field. So this is BD minus BD dagger is an electric field operator. Uh, and we, here we have quite uh, something quite similar to that. And we know about quantum Rabi model that usually people always uh, move to the uh, what is called James Cummins model by assuming that uh, by changing this sigma x multiplied bd minus bd uh, dagger uh, to something like sigma plus bd uh, plus sigma minus bd uh, bd dagger and throwing out the terms which are proportional to sigma plus BD dagger uh, and well, sigma minus BD. And Jane Cummings model is nice. So you have the simple analytical solution and so on and so forth. But actually, Vanya, 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 Vanya. can I can come in before you went yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. away from James Cummings? Uh, first, you forgot G in Cummings uh, name, I think. So. Ah, really? Uh, okay, but this is. Uh, this is a side comment uh, and uh, so uh, but also another question mm, is really. also about also about g but mm -hmm. g which is coupling constant so mm -hmm. normally jane so in a vast majority of textbooks mm -hmm. uh, the james cummings model so g uh, the coupling constant is assumed to be real mm -hmm. uh, right and uh, but here you here you have this imaginary part uh, so can you can well, you give well, in? No, no. I'm not I'm not quite uh, following. Could you? Uh, uh, well, yeah, it's real. But actually, if you if you change uh, BD to IBD, mm -hmm. you can say. So it. normally in textbooks it, there is no I in front of G. Yeah, G is yeah. real, and there is plus in the brackets. Yeah. Right? So yeah, now you the, take. Coupling constant to be imaginary, then you make uh, the no, no, no. Newtonian to Misha, be my complete my, my coupling cos my coupling my coupling coupling constant is real. You can in, because it's G is still real. You can introduce right. a, you can can move I to mm -hmm. the okay sure sure. Yeah. Why do you have this additional I? Can you give me any? No, uh, well, it's not it's Hermitian a, model. Yes, we all want it. Uh, the, yeah, well, Misha, what are you talking about? The right the right part of or my left part the right part the, the ah. right part in the right part i doesn't matter at all it's just a matter of convention you you can say that bd is ibd you still have the same commutation relations uh, and uh, and uh, you get rid of i and here you have bd uh, tilt plus bd Okay, you just like, wanted for conven for convention to make it looking similar as yeah, your yes, non Hermitian yes. Hamiltonian in a way, yeah. So we could give mm -hmm. have some, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and there is no physical difference. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, you, you cannot. So quantum Rabi model is Hermitian. That's what matters. Yeah. Here, uh, uh, quantum Rabi model is to the right. What we have to the left is non Hermitian. So right. Absolutely. It, it, yeah, even if you if you if you change uh, variables uh, to the right, you cannot uh, convert your non-Hermitian model to a Hermitian model. Sure. Okay. And then the same holds for the Rabi model, right? So yeah, and uh, uh, in James Cummins model, to make these uh, changes, you can actually need you actually need. Uh, uh, 
uh, G uh, much less than photonic and atomic uh, energy, but uh, in the nasty case or, or in nice case where G is, is uh, order or even larger than that, you get the, what is called ultrasound coupling between light and matter. So there's a nice, nice recent review on that. And they actually where uh, different miracles start to appear. So you have non vacuum ground states uh, in your model. So the uh, energy ground states correspond to non zero population of the photons in the system. You have different phase transition. Like people suggest that you can change the phase of materials inside the cavities in this regime. So quite nice uh, matter. And uh, 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 moving back to, to our kind of Hamiltonian, we got uh, the effective coupling strength, which is proportional to gamma null eta. And we can see that when gamma null eta exceeds our, uh, our phononic frequency uh, omega, you can actually you, you move to the regime of the ultrasonic coupling. And now it, it, why it's interesting, because now usually like in the in conventional Rabi model, uh, you, you have omega x uh, or, or cavity mode frequencies of the order of one electron volt, and your coupling strength is of the order, I say, well, milli electron volts, right? Uh, in order to make it larger, you, can, you should think of some uh, ultra sub wavelength localization. Uh, plasmonic cavities, many other like quite complicated stuff. People are, are, are str like struggling for for making this ratio of g uh, omega x say 0 0.1 to be able to observe some effects of the ultrasound coupling. Here, your uh, gamma zero actually corresponds to the optical uh, optical uh, coupling strength, so it's still milli electron volts. But now, uh, omega large is, uh, is, as we've discussed, of the order of uh, 100 kilohertz. So in this uh, optomechanical setup, you get this ultrasound coupling, uh, uh, well, more or less automatically, right? You don't, you don't need to engineer to invent uh, uh, like special, Design of the cavities to squeeze light at the subway plant to maximize it. So you got this ultrasound coupling. Uh, so like uh, a little bit hand waving or advertising. So uh, waveguide quantum mechanics can be a key to ultrasound coupling wonderland. So this is Alice and the other guys get and probably to the move into the wonderland. Uh, and uh, well, let's return to our Hamiltonian. So this uh, this is our Hamiltonian for the two qubits. And well, if we uh, if we change the specific so phi phi, it corresponds to the stationary position of items. And if we choose the specific phase of p over two, we get uh, this type of the Hamiltonian. And we can see that in this case our Hamiltonian becomes what is called the parity time symmetry, uh, obtains the parity time symmetry uh, property. Well, uh, there are different definitions. I uh, use the simplest definition of the parity time symmetry. I just say that uh, uh, we have this harmonic potential with the additional potential, which is just plus minus gamma zero and exponent. And we can notice that our harmonic potential, it has the property that the Complex conjugate equals to the uh, to the uh, complex uh, to the to the same potential, but with a negative uh, displacement. Yeah, it's very simple. It's just a simple property of this exponent, right? Uh, and well, there is a huge uh, area of this non-Hermitian quantum mechanics, and there's a nice book about that. Uh, and well. But what we know about parity time symmetry, we know that actually these non Hermitian Hamiltonians can actually have a real spectrum up to some point. Uh, but then at some point, by changing this, the value of this coupling, uh, 
for the strength of this non-hermitian potential, at some point you can have what is called the PT phase transition. So at some point your real uh, energies start, they like collapse to each other and uh, uh, the system is now characterized by the complex, complex conjugated uh, eigen energies. And that's what actually what we observe. So this is some generic spectrum of our problem. So uh, like blue dash correspond to minus sign, uh, red solid lines correspond to the uh, plus sign. And we can notice that uh, for, for these red lines for the first two states and well in the third and the fourth state, so when you increase the coupling parameter, which is in our case eta, you get your, uh, in, in, you know, in the beginning you get the real spectrum, but then as you move to the larger coupling, uh, the, uh, the eigen energies, they move together and at some point here they collapse uh, and instead of real spectrum, yeah, you've got the complex conjugate uh solutions yeah characterized by uh positive and negative imaginary part it should be noted here that even though we have a negative imaginary part it doesn't mean that we start that we have generation here right because actually uh uh pt symmetric isn't our effective hamiltonian but is the effective hamiltonian with a constant imaginary part e gamma zero right so our uh, uh, our uh, eigenstates, they have a specific sign of the uh, negative or negative sign of our uh, eigen energy, or positive, well, but the specific one, which correspond to decay, yeah? But after the PT uh, phase transition, uh, one of the states can uh, start to decay uh, faster, and the other one, uh, on the contrary, it starts to decay uh, uh, slower and it becomes, and it approaches in some way, it approaches, almost approaches the, uh, the zero decay, so it becomes kind of a dark state, right? Cool, Vanya, sorry for interrupting you. I believe there yeah. was some uh, work from Frank Tamori, but on mm -hmm. classical level, uh, they also considered some like two cavities coupled to waveguide, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, it was even the title of the paper, like lo losing to win or something like that. So mm -hmm. in order to de decrease the loss for one cavity, they increased the losses for another one. So yeah. you, you probably know that work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's what they actually do in this PT, uh, PT symmetry breaking uh, sign. So they have two, they, they play, they have couple cavities and they play uh, with uh, coupling strength and uh, decay rates, and they can not only increase the decay rate of the cavities, but they actually can sufficiently suppress it. And that's that's what actually happens uh, here as well. Yeah, nice. Thank you for the comment, Maxim. I would li I only would like to mention that usually uh, in the people uh, in these PT symmetric systems, people treat uh well they they write down the wave function uh, and then they somehow artificially introduce gain and loss in these systems in an, and in order to have this pt uh, symmetry and pt symmetry breaking you need quite nicely engineered gain and loss profiles so the system is uh, uh well you need like very very uh, neat engineering of gain and loss which usually hard in this system, we don't actually uh, introduce this uh, PT uh, potential somewhere from like externally. It just emerges in uh, two qubits interacting uh, via waveguide modes. Yeah, so that's quite a difference. So when it's not really speaking the type of PT symbols we are used in, in photonics, right? Because your yeah. system in, in overall is loss. Yes. Yeah. So you don't compensate the losses fully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You well, because because you don't have any external gain in your system actually. Right. 
and and okay, and also I have a course so that uh, this uh, ether right, so which your coupling constant parameter right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's kind of phase difference between the atoms right, or something like this right. Well, yeah, it's proportional. So it's it's how the displacement. Uh, so it's the proportionality coefficient between the phase difference and displacements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so Misha, you are right. So if the phase were say pi, ah, we would you mean have some super radians mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe some I don't know long living states emerging because of this coupling and if the phase is pi over two like 20 years ago at Yofi we were calling this anti break structure <laughs> now it's called pt symmetric structure <laughs> but it's absolutely the same so everything is engineered by this phase yeah, yeah but the, yeah. the cap the amplitude of the coupling constant is kept constant sorry for sorry may, may i have a comment here um, uh, i think that uh, the coupling and also loss uh, between the resonator is not very hard to be balanced because if you consider the two resonators that the distance can be changed can be um, adjusted therefore we can uh, we can adjust we can balance uh, between gain and loss but uh, the main problem here uh, the resonance frequency of the resonator because if the re uh, resonant frequency of the resonator should be equal to each other. And um, I think the um, most difficulty in these systems is that we have all of the resonator have the same re resonant frequency. And um, uh, when one resonator has a different frequency, then uh, we may have not this uh, PT symmetry in this system. Okay, thank you, Shahab. I think if these are atoms, I am not a specialist at all, but for me as a semiconductor physicist, all atoms are the same. <laughs> and if so, they have the same frequency, it's not a problem. And if these are superconducting qubits, so they have quite high fabrication quality, so you can have relatively high precision. So, so I, I'll have to converge the discussion. Because I have two more slides and the time is up, so okay. hopefully. Okay, okay, let's go. So uh, this picture actually uh, is a phase diagram, which tells you uh, where this PT phase transition occurs in the dimensions of this gamma zero and eta, uh, and the white line actually uh, tells you where uh, where you have. Uh, it separates the regions where you have purely real spectrum for all the eigenstates and uh, the, the uh, regions where you have uh, uh, at least some of the uh, non-real uh, eigenenergies. Uh, blue and red uh, and green lines, they correspond to, to the PT phase transition for these first two pairs of the red lines. And uh, and the yellow dash line corresponds to, to the condition gamma zero eta equals one. That's this ultra strong coupling condition, which we, because everything is now counted in, uh, in the omega frequencies, right? So this tells you, it separates the regions of the uh, usual coupling and ultra strong coupling. So everything which is to the right and to the up of, of, uh, of, uh, a yellow dash line is just this USC regime. And you can see that, roughly speaking, your PT phase transitions start to appear in this USC region. And probably, uh, well, uh, the final slides, what we can do further, apart from so far, apart from, uh, apart from uh, eigenenergies, we can actually compute the single photon, uh, photon scattering from our system. And this is a, a nice expression courtesy of uh, Sasha Kinski. Uh, actually, you can uh, introduce the Green's function for your system, and you, knowing the Green function, you can compute the transmission and reflection coefficient, which correspond to the absorption or emission uh, of certain number of S or D phonons. So T and S and D, 
corresponds to the transmission or reflection coefficient uh, with the absorption of NS and ND phonons. And uh, well, you can see that here we have a sum of the intermediate states. And uh, here uh, in the sum of the intermediate states, we have uh, this difference uh, of energies in the denominator. And usually our um, energies are, uh, are, can be complex. But when one of the, uh, one of the, these intermediate energies, uh, uh, how to say, approaches the real line, so darkens, we would have kind of a resonance in the transmission coefficient. And uh, this could be actually uh, uh, traced in the uh, transmission coefficient. So we, we, would, we would have a, a, like a, a amplification of the transmission uh, with the uh, excitation or emission of a phonon. And that's what we see here. So this is the, the map, which is in the dimensions of delta and eta. And we can see that uh, as we approach, uh, we increase eta as we approach the, the frequency which corresponds to the frequency of, uh, of, uh, of this PT transition where the, one of the imaginary parts uh, uh, of the state goes to zero, you get this, you can see I'll choose another probably, you, you can see this bright spot, which corresponds to the uh, intensification of the transmission at this line. So this effects of PT symmetry can be actually tracked, uh, PT symmetry breaking can be tracked in the, in the single photon transmission analysis. Uh, interestingly, uh, also you have the increase of the transmission of the single uh, 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 photon in the frequencies uh, which are below the lowest uh, excited states of our system. So even though we are in the ground state, uh, no phonons, you can still, uh, you can still excite uh, a single phonon. So, and this is also the consequence of this ultra strong coupling regime. So uh, this brings me to my conclusion. Uh, Quantum optomechanics is cool. It enables uh, ultrasound coupling. Uh, you got in the simplest model you got the emergence of the PT symmetry breaking or without uh, engineered gain loss. Uh, well, still with engineered phase, okay. Uh, but to be done, it's a multi photon propagation. Uh, and well, this system would, I believe, also allow generation of non classical photons and phonons. And well, I believe that quantum optical mechanics opens like a brave new world. And here it's a uh, title of, the, of this nice book of Aldon Huxley. And this uh, uh, Earth also here likes a looks like a qubit, uh, some way. So that yeah, that's pretty much all. I'm I'm ready to uh, answer uh, any questions if there are any. So, Vanya, thank you for the interesting talk. Mm -hmm. uh, let me start just with the first question. Yes. Uh, let's, let's go to the slide with this PT symmetry. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we partially discussed that uh, in the case, let's say, uh, all the states, if, even in this uh, PT symmetric phase, actually have the imaginary uh, part of yes. energy equal to minus uh, I gamma zero, mm -hmm. losses. Then my question, how precisely do we need to fulfill this condition phi is equal to phi over two? Because it oh. seems that in the nearby points of phi, there should be something similar. So yeah, there definitely. should be states. Yes, so what is the so restriction? Definitely. Uh, 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 thank you, Maxim. Yeah, indeed, we don't need to be exactly at the single point of phi because the system has some imaginary part anyway. And uh, uh, when you change uh, phi slightly, well, you have some distortion of your picture, but nothing, uh, nothing, uh, how to call, disappears, right? You, you, you still see the, the kind of uh, uh, 
of a splitting of your states, but the only difference is that uh, even uh, before this transition, the, your eigenenergies have some non-zero uh, imaginary part. So in this case, this is rather a stable phenomena, not limited to a single point of phi equal to pi over two. Actually, what we did in the simulations, we did uh, shift it from phi equal to pi over two in order to be able to discriminate different uh, states. And actually, we we got uh, we got the pictures which were hardly distinguishable from the exact phi equal to pi over two case. So in this case, the 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 system is quite stable. Okay, thank you, Vanya. So some other mm -hmm. questions, Misha? Max, maybe I have. Vanya, um, a, a nasty question. So nasty. One, okay. once, once you get from this nice theoretical picture mm -hmm. to some real life, uh, mm -hmm. and you have qubit, qubits, and you have like quantum, like any system, they also might have interactions, not only through waveguide, but through near fields or something. Uh, which might often happen, and also with the even with the atoms, mm -hmm. if they are at sh it's like wavelength shorter than like at the distance around wavelength. So, can you comment something on that? Can you avoid yeah, nice. it? Or? No, no, yeah, we, well, of course, we didn't include uh, yeah, it in the uh, in our uh, Hamiltonian, which is uh, well, briefly because. Uh, for us, it was quite compli already complicated. Yeah, but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just it. But then uh, probably it, it 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 would be quite interesting to if we look at this Hamiltonian, right? You could start. Uh, you could add something. Uh, some uh, I can draw. You can add some terms which will be proportional v at uh, x e minus x g sigma. I uh, no no e sigma g which will correspond to some uh, direct uh -huh, uh -huh. right and then uh, even nicer you can again uh, draw the uh, heads here and look uh, what's happening uh -huh. here what you can okay introduce that i and that g and then linearize everything with respect to xi and xg so this is a this is an additional option for changing our system, but I don't think that that uh, this I, I I cannot I I don't know, but for now I cannot imagine how it should destroy everything. Mm -hmm. uh, Misha, if I may add, so I think without phonons, uh, such system has been realized for superconducting qubits with the spacing phi over two. And it's I've put it in the chat. It's science paper from Van Lu from 2013. So there it works. Uh, and then if we add vibrations, maybe even the challenge, maybe another challenge would be that atoms in our model vibrate as a whole, or qubits mm -hmm. vibrate as a whole, and they do not deform when they move. So maybe actually this is an issue in some sense, but the Hamiltonian as well is not a problem. Just the question is that if the qubit moves, it does not deform in this model. While in real life, who knows? Yeah, but my question okay. uh, about uh, technological side, uh, namely these qubits are embedded into the circuit. So in order to ensure that the qubits are moving, you have to move the circuit itself. So it, it, it seems like, Quite complicated task. So maybe some other design is needed. I don't. Know. So Maxim, there have been papers with trembling qubits, uh, experimental ones. So uh, how they are doing? Of course. This? Well, I am not experimentalist. Good question. I I don't exactly remember. But in principle, you have a vibrating microwave resonator. It's not that big deal. And if it's vibrating, it stays superconducting. So I'm I am even not sure that for the waveguide design. Only thing I can say that well, I'll try to now to look and put in the chat. But yeah, that's, been... that's interesting because 
I can imagine vibrating resonator, but you have to maintain electric contact and uh, still keep the superconducting. So it's, it's well, somehow they manage, but I will look. Yeah, it's of course not easy. Okay, some other questions from the audience, please take your chance. So in the meantime, I would ask another question. So in the beginning, Vanya, you mentioned that uh, in the dynamical Casimir effect, we uh, ensure emission of uh, photons in pairs. So can you maybe give some qualitative reason why this bunching happens? So what is the source of this bunching? No, Maxim, I cannot. Okay, uh, anyway, it's... it's yeah, I'll be true answer. Yeah, it's interesting. I can just uh, refer, well, I'm still, it was like, I was, when I was preparing for the presentation, I was thinking, I was thinking about the effects where you can have something interesting uh, by quantizing only electric uh, field without the pound is causing your effect and I, want, I heard briefly something, but I still, I'm still not ready to discuss in the, in the details. Okay, okay. Maxim, anyway, I can so only good. say that if we survive the virus, and if our course on optomechanics for master students survives for next <laughs> year, maybe it is a good subject for a lecture and maybe mm -hmm. after a year we will know more. Okay. Asha, I believe it will not just survive, it will, you know, like... Enhanced. Enhanced for extended let's, to one year course. Let's see, mm -hmm. let's see. Okay, so since there are no other questions, I suggest that we thank, uh, thank everyone for this wonderful talk. Yes, mm -hmm. and next time we are having a seminar of Alek Yermakov. This is pre-defense. So see you next time. And thank you for coming. Thank Stay you, guys. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.